oh, I've got this personal bet on that we get to 100 people by 12.35. And there's like, oh, it's 12.35, we should start. Okay, we're going to start with 96 people. Okay, so um, welcome to Art Forum. Um, wherever you are in Australia, in Victoria, in Melbourne, in the world, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm coming to you live from my lounge room. This is my dog, Bailey, sitting in my lap. And for those of you who don't know me, my name's David Sequera. I'm the director of the Margaret Lawrence Gallery, and I'm also the person that puts together the Art Forum program. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are right now located. And for most of us, that's going to be in South Central Victoria, um, the Kulin Nation. And I really do ask you to join me in acknowledging that the work of artists, song, dance, painting, ritual, took place here by the traditional custodians for many, many generations before us. And that these art practices were intimately linked with ideas around healing, land management, health, sustenance, welfare, law, and language. Now to our guest speaker today. Failure, humour, and vulnerability have been important issues in the work of Simone Slee. While earlier works derived from the deployment of her own body in relation to space, time, and objects, Simone's practice over the past decade has constituted a negotiation of the problems and questions raised by sculpture and modernism. Often the performance-based sculptural works resulting from these investigations were located in the public or social realm. More recent works have involved unlikely combinations of stone and glass, the robust and the fragile. Simone Slee holds the position of Senior Lecturer and Research Convener at the Victorian College of the Arts. Please make her welcome. Um, thank you, David. <laughs> um, thank you for the um, virtual clapping I can see in the background. It's an incredible privilege to be here today on and quite a nerve-wracking proposition given that I think perhaps for all of us, one at the precipice of one of the most profound events in world history in the last 100 years. And I don't think any of us are going to forget the last week or two we've had. So I'm incredibly privileged to be here today um, talking um, and being able to share um, the work. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, and take incredible strength from the amazing resilience of our First Nations people when we're facing such a humongous, um, potentially, and already having quite damaging effects of the coronavirus, I take great strength from Indigenous people who've lived here for over 60,000 years, where they've seen through the last ice age. So what an inspiration. And I'm going to show you, the, I'm located here and, as I mentioned earlier, before people came on, my husband kindly lent me a section of his studio where the Wi-Fi is best um, in Pascoval South. We're located on the Mooney Ponds Creek, right behind the sound wall, which you go up and down if you're leaving, but you can't anymore <laughs> to go up to Tullamarine Freeway. And this is the land of the Wurundjeri people. So I'm incredibly privileged to be working here. And like all of you, negotiating a new um, world with my family um, and their other commitments who have kindly let the Wi-Fi um, be, f be free um, for it so we can maximise that. So um, thank you and thank you everybody else here today. It's such a, so wonderful to have you here. So I guess the other thing I was struck by, um, David, my husband, sent me off an article by a chap called Will Heinrich um, recently who writes for the New York Times and just mentioning, um, and I had this experience also the other day where uh, he was saying that in times like these, the small aesthetic experiences of walking down the street, uh, and he recalled C.S. Lewis giving a lecture to new Oxford graduates um, in 1939, whereas where in that situation on the precipice of, um, precipice of war, looking at these catastrophic 
conditions really reminding us what our humanity is all about and really the importance of culture in being able to um, nourish us. And I also felt that the other day when I walked in and saw the uh, drawing and printmaking show in the VCA art space. So I'll get on and um, looking forward to questions afterwards. Thank you. So I'm now I'm going to share my screen with you all and I'm hopefully going to get this right. Um, share. Okay, so here we are. So this is my uh, impromptu uh, lectern that you would normally see for an art forum, but here we are at home. So primarily I'm going to speak today about uh, the most recent body of works, uh, the rock and glass work commencing, I guess, in the, only in the last few years. And some of you may be familiar with the work. Can you hear me okay? You're getting, hear, hear me, yeah. So, but before that, yeah, before I do, um, I just thought I'd actually talk more generally about some of the key um, principles that have been guiding the work, really, and some of the key sources of earlier artworks that set up this, these particular concerns through the practice. And there's primarily um, four uh, main concerns that I've been working with over the last, uh, I guess, at least 10 years. One is a concept called ab function, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and that was a notion, a neologism that actually I, I invented out of prior artwork, which my PhD was focused on, which I finished a few years ago. Primarily also the problem of holding up. Like once again, that's been a kind of sculpture issue to do with sculpture. Um, and I just, how things can hold up. And I guess it's not only about sculpture, but actually now in the light of the conditions we're in today, it also becomes a broader issue as well. Concerns around material agency or what was understood as truth to materials through a modernist paradigm. And um, the importance of sight and also more recently, the notions of time. And I think if you see the earlier work as we move along, you'll begin to understand how these um, concerns beginning to begin to kind of play out in the work. Um, also to say that clearly my um, practice comes out of a Western notion of art um, coming from America, Europe um, and, and the UK. So you'll see that coming here, but really a very old work just to begin with, to set some of the scene that some of you may be familiar with were the um, on body suits that I produced back in the end of my masters. And it was really here where this notion of ab function emerged for me um, as as a notion and it was really came, came out of actually giving a lecture like this where I tried to explain what these suits were actually doing. So um, they were, I invited a range of people to wear these body suits which actually strapped on the back um, and exposed the, uh, what I was interested in was um, the way the, the different parts of the body and exposed the critical and I guess the emotional side of the body which was the stomach region. Ideas of ab function came about because these suits weren't really functional, but they kind of moved away from traditional notions of, um, of function. It was really trying to explain that idea that um, this concept ab function arose. So when I started my PhD, I really began to look into what this notion could be and to see the veracity of whether this term had any legs. And by pure chance, it was an intuitive word that came to my mind without any great <laughs> um, thought initially. But as I looked into it, ab has a kind of Latin derivation, which means to move away or depart from um, from function in the and um, in the production of the work. So in the initial phases of the work, there was a kind of initial pro a provisional definition of doing the right thing with the wrong thing, and it's inverse doing the wrong thing with the right thing, and this idea of ab function became a method of me or a way of producing artwork um, um, in the studio to, yeah. But actually later on through the PhD, I came to understand that ab function could be seen not only as an effect or effect of the artwork, but also a methodology for making art. This also goes back to some earlier work, um, which I was keeping an eye on the time here, um, called Make a Sculpture that came out of uh, when I was really fortunate enough to have a sand stag and went to live and work in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, where I was a, a student of Aisha Erkman's at the Städel Schule. So this was a key work called Make a Sculpture, Watch It Fall Down um, that I produced. 
and I guess it also brings in this issue of how to, how a sculpture hold up. So, and issues of materiality as well in terms of the performance idea of the work. So what was um, also humorous idea that this work would actually be propped up by that very marginal uh, cardboard stick prop at the back. And when the cardboard prop fatigued, which it did, it became tired, then the sculpture would fall and collapse. And so it was the actual event of the collapse that the sculpture became it, um, itself. So this also led to other kind of prop sculptures that I produced, again, questioning notions of what it is that holds things up. So here in this particular artwork, I used, um, and you'll see these themes play out in different ways with the work. Um, I used a cucumber in which to um, support the sculpture um, from, from falling. So of course, actually what is of interest here is, it is actually the vulnerable, uh, object that actually enables uh, the holding up of the work of the holding up of the sculpture. Just another kind of interest which you'll see playing out is the um, in the work is the role of materials. So here I was because I was working in Germany I was working with very improvised materials simply cardboard um, and also what's called Spiegelfolie which is a um, German word for mirror foil and I'm, I was interested in playing off the immaterial and glamour of the Spiegelfolie and the muteness and the prosaic nature of the cardboard in the artwork. There's also a play here going on with um, you know, the heroic formal sculpture and here being made out of an improvised um, uh, material. Another work quickly just to develop this idea was also a work called Helper Sculpture um, where I invited uh, eight fish in which to hold up a sculpture. So just a kind of note here that I was working within the parameters of when a goldfish gets trans, um, transferred from an aquarium. So I was using the kind of standards of what would not stress a fish in this particular situation. And they generously were able to help me support um, a particular sculpture, which I was, uh, which I performed acting the, putting the, facilitating the fish to stand the sculpture up for a very short period of time between 10 or 20 minutes, um, which wouldn't compromise the nature of the fish. So after that particular cycle of time, this was an ongoing continuous um, performance, I would remove the sculpture, the, move the fish and the sculpture again would collapse. Not long after uh, when I commenced the PhD, again questioning notions of, um, of um, how something holds up was this work, How Long Can I Hold This Up, where I took photos of myself with the same placard, a very light form, which it, or in my initial stage, it seemed very humorous that I would try and hold up something that was light that didn't have that sense of labour to it, yet actually, um, so there was a kind of conundrum and a rhetorical question around that. So I've, the other aspect of this particular work, so I took photographs of myself where I happen to be in everyday places um, across uh, the world. Uh, an important aspect which I'll bring, come to the, um, later on is uh, the role of site and how different sites provide different opportunities for reinstalling and reinvigorating the work. So this, obviously that's Margaret Lawrence, which we all know and love um, at my PhD exhibition. Earlier on, I had the opportunity to show this work in a street context where um, uh, posters were renewed, street posters were renewed on a regular basis over the um, exhibition duration. Just continuing to follow on, um, I moved from this idea of collapse and the imminence of collapse and then this concept of time and the duration to the idea of uh, how something can hold up and just hold in that as if it um, has a kind of just holding a breath for that moment and to elongate the duration of that particular um, time. So I, these uh, works developed out of that kind of concern, just uh, with an ever so slight um, holding up and again, shifting the way my body operated within those particular works. This led to a series of video works, um, which actually I'm conscious don't actually uh, translate particularly well in your format, but I've got, if you want to go back and look at them, I've got the Vimeo password and content here. 
So you may be able to see, maybe not, it's a bit jerky. It's a very, very, this is um, called a hold down where um, the, it actually functions almost rather as a moving photograph rather than a moving, rather than a video where there's a very subtle uh, movement. And when it, it was produced in its, um, in the video monitor, there was a sense of uh, nausea that would happen with the viewer as well in this kind of uh, durational holding where there's never a kind of beginning or an end to the video. There's also something that began to happen, which was interesting in terms of the gravitational pull. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, a development of this work that happened several years ago um, at uh, an exhibition I had at Sarah Scout called Rocks Happy to Help Hold Down where I began to take this concept out into the landscape and the landscape has been an emerging um, site like the other works um, out in the city uh, or in the environment. But so where I took this work into um, was actually at Mount Alexander, which is a rock site, not for at Jajawarung country. Can you see that or is that very jerky for people? We can see it, looks great. <laughs> so with these works, I was interested in um, also this gravitational pull and the, um, again, there was, unlike the earlier works, which would have a direct beginning, a middle and an end, these works um, actually, have no beginning and middle and end and it shifts notions of time that really moved from being um, maybe what was understood traditionally as clock time which is much which is time that's progressive uh, really emerged out of uh, industrialization through uh, I guess the 19th century to do with production and the conveyor belt and the development of the Swiss watch where everything was measured to a, a more durational sense. And I think for some people that are interested in notions of time, um, Henri Bergson writes very eloquently about this notion of time that actually expands and contracts. And that was something that I was interested in here. These works were initially a kind of challenge to me as well because, whoops. <laughs> um, I was interested, normally I am very interested in the action of the work and the pragmatics of that within the practice. And once I, and, and not interested in the potential um, uh, effect or quick effect of doing something like turning up upside, something upside down. But when I did do that in this, these particular works, what I noticed was there was a greater understanding that developed through the work of the, the way gravity functions um, within the site. So there was something about making visible gravity that was really quite compelling um, with these works. I'll just go back and you'll see the install of that particular work. And I guess what was of interest to me in all of the way that I operate, which is the issue I mentioned earlier about sight, was um, the role of sight in actually generating the, uh, the formal solutions for how I hang the work. So again, like you'll see this in the following work as well, like the pendulous quality of the um, action, I, I reiterated that within the actual site of the um, architecture of the space. Again, this is another work that develops on from that called um, Rocks Happy to Help Hold Up, Hold Down. Some of you would also be familiar with this work. You can go back and have a look at that later if you'd like to. This really kind of, these kinds of concerns in terms of gravity, weight, uh, these are very much sculptural notions, but equally I think um, 
have broader application, I guess, within our everyday lives. And I had this incredible opportunity at that point in the making of the work to have a residency at Berlin Glass. Um, and it was a part of uh, an Australia, Germany now DFAT um, opportunity where there was an exchange between um, Australian and German artists and institutions. Berlin Glass is a really amazing uh, glass workshop um, based in Berlin. and. Um, I approached this, I never had the opportunity to work with glass. And of course, one of the problems working with glass is what is it do you do with glass when it's already such a profoundly beautiful medium? How can you make art out of something that already is beautiful? So that was very foremost in my mind when I was making these works. And I guess, um, so just to also say here that there was a, an amazing woman called Nadania Idris, who is the director of this place. And I had the great opportunity to work with Jesse Gunter, who you'll see here and side in the background on, the, on my left, where I had the opportunity to learn some of the skills, but actually develop a whole series of work. Nadania is in the background there working away. So it was a really, um, here I began to, really test those ideas of what is it I could do with glass that continue to explore my interest in both uh, the idea of how something could hold up, what are the limits of the material um, and what could it sustain. And these are, uh, what's that word, uh, dual, I guess, conditions of certain materials where certain materials seem robust and strong, others seem fragile and I could somehow um, confound those con those particular understandings, which again kind of folds back to this idea of ab function, where unexpected functions or outcomes occur with um, the particular materials. So these are the really, I had a, was one, only one week and it was an amazing opportunity to work with these people who were um, just brilliantly um, flexible and open-minded. So in the way that I conventionally work, I would often find um, found materials. And here in the courtyard, I found bricks and I found um, cobblestones. And I was keen on the inverse. Um, what is it if I actually put pressure on these glass bubbles that are being produced through the body through air? And to what degree could the glass sustain the pressure and the weight of these heavy materials. Anyway, it still continues to be a miracle to me about how these um, two things um, work. Okay. So once I came back from Ger Germany and had that opportunity, and this is actually a kind of interesting anecdote, which also continued this confounding of my expectations. I wrapped up all these glass with the help of Nadania uh, glass objects and sent them home to Australia through DHL. It was, they were beautifully packed up and I thought, oh, the rocks would be fine. The rocks and the bricks will be fine. So I quickly put them in a, in a package and sent them home. But in fact, the glass came home perfectly undamaged and the rocks and the bricks were the ones that came back shattered. So um, it was not what I expected. When I arrived back in Australia, I was really interested in continuing what the potential of um, these particular relationships. Uh, so I began to extend this uh, experiment with a range of different rocks, a range of different forms. I'm still on quite a small scale, um, you know, often 30 to 40 centimetres high. So there was, and here I was sourcing, and I was just to say um, in terms of materials and sourcings that one thing that is of interest to me is that we live in an ecology of actions with materials, with other people, and that when you make artwork, you exist in this um, dialogue, which is also something about the way ab, uh, ab function works, where you've got a series of different um, elements that you're working and negotiating at, and listening to it and allowing that to evolve into um, something that's unexpected. So where I'm sourcing materials, I've been thinking about these rocks, for example, that you see here, are scoria rocks, which I've been sourcing from quarries, but this comes from in the digger rest, digger's rest for, um, area, which is on the land of the Jaja Wurrung people. 
Oh, it comes out of um, a volcano, it's volcanic rock. Again, different kind of functions. Like I, at this point, I didn't know how would these amorphous rocks deal with the glass. Here's um, actually cut stone, which is travertine that comes, that's imported from uh, Turkey. So there's a kind of global trade of stone and materials that occurs. Every uh, glass maker will have a particular kind of batch of glass. Sometimes glass is imported from China. Other times there'll be a more local batch of glass that they'll, that'll be sourced. So here, in fact, the kind of pressure of the forming of the work is a consequence of, uh, the outcome of the work is a consequence of the pressures and the way the work is formed. So here the rocks were kind of slid together in order to produce this kind of um, form. So you can see a range of different, I'm just flicking through these forms here, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, so I had this wonderful opportunity to show these works again with the video works that you saw at Sarah Scout several, a uh, couple of, well, almost 18 months, two years ago now. And I was interested in working on how I can operate within the space um, with these particular works. So I designed this plinth form and you'll see the way that I've been using these strategies in the space as I go along. Um, again, I, I was looking here, these works migrated, as I was mentioning before about the way the site can function as a way of generating uh, a different kind of solution for the display of the work. And here I was had the opportunity to show at the Windsor Hotel where I introduced a kind of in, into an insertion of the um, of a, almost like a kind of diving board or streamlined plinth into the um, dining room in which to locate and use the existing furniture as a kind of prop or plinth uh, for the works itself. Again, this is another kind of installation of uh, the hold up, hold down video um, that some may have seen at the uh, manifesto show at Margaret Lawrence. Again, always interested in this tenuous sense of balance and support and registering that in the um, body of the viewer as they move around the works. Um, following, I was again really privileged to get a, an Australia Council grant where I, for um, new work and I had an opportunity to have a residency at the South Australian School of Art. Uh, in their glass workshop run by Gabriella Bissetto. And so I was, in this particular uh, opportunity, I was again continuing a range of experiments with different kinds of glass and its relationship with how it would actually work uh, with scale, as well as a variety of different stones, which do work differently with the glass and the heat. I then extended that residency to work with the jam factory and you could see here a range of different people. Um, I guess you could begin to see the kind of dialogue that was happening where I was working, not just, and beginning to scale up with the stones to test the capacity of the glass and, and, and the stone, um, but also working with larger teams of people. One of the brilliant things about um, working with glass blowers is the phenomenal um, team work and kinesthetic understanding they have between one another as they work um, together. There's a kind of intuitive sense of uh, who's doing the blowing, how far you have to blow it up and a language that goes along with that. So uh, that was a really important part of the process, me beginning to learn that language in which to be able to communicate uh, with this Llewellyn there in the yellow who was, being, was blowing the glass with Crystal on the left, Alex up the top. So that, that kind of dialogue in the production of the work became really critical for the making. So I guess that's also the kind of ecology of, uh, of making that occurs in the production of the work. Um, just, I think this is sort of a lovely image just showing the process of actually us communicating in a standard way that um, glass blowers will 
and David, you might have had this experience too when you've worked with glass blowers, the way they draw out ideas and how you work through um, how something will be produced. So this led to a series of larger scale works um, where, um, I'm just checking on the time, where I began to continue to, as I mentioned before, um, test, you know, what, it, what are the limits of the glass and its capacity to hold up um, quite heavy objects. So this is a, a floor work that I developed for a show that I was in at Dissident Assemblies for at King's recently. And then a larger scale scoria um, rock um, from the earlier one, where I began to also begin to continue the language of the plinths um, for the work. What became apparent is that while each of these were not only uh, testing the relationship of the glass, which is understood to be fragile, but also its capacity to um, reveal more about the stone than actually I initially ever understood. So you can see in this particular work, I can't point to it, but what was amazing was the way the glass in its casting form would begin to pick up the light and reflect the, uh, uh, the formation and form of the rock itself. Something very interesting also in the way that the problems of, or the, how air in this case can also be the force that maintains the holding up of the rock. So um, again, I had this uh, following on, I had another exhibition where I was able to install these new works at a larger scale uh, at Sarah Scout and begin to kind of uh, locate these works into the, and, uh, in an in situ way dovetail them into the space. Again, in these spaces, all in these works, I was continuing this notion of the precariousness and the capacity to hold up. And really to my um, amazement is this is a this rock holding up, I can't remember what number it is. Um, the glass here is holding up, it's something, it's overall the sculptures about 50 kilos, 45, 50 kilos. So that's about 12 or 13 kilos um, on the top. And this particular rock I feel quite fond of. I um, sourced this rock from a, coal, a, a quarry in Colac on the Western District Plains near Colac. And that's the traditional lands of the Jag, Jagad Warung and the Wiradjuri Oh, sorry, what a Wurrung and the Gudajans people, but it's also the country that I grew up on as a teenager. So I have a, I grew up at the bottom of one of these uh, volcanic cones. So I have a kind of personal connection to this particular formation of rock. But what was also of interest to me is the kind of internal landscape that the glass, as you could see in, can you see that detail? I guess it depends where you've got your um, pictures of everybody else. Um, the way that the glass would begin to, what was great, working with the, um, uh, with the glass blowers, the way the glass would begin to tag and connect and then with more air, it would begin to then stretch out and you could see the um, uh, elasticity and uh, veracity of the glass. Hello, why can't I move that arm? the installation shot. So I'm, I'm squinting because that's not, okay, I just. So this returns me to the most recent, oh, the, one of the images I commenced at the beginning where um, I installed this work in front of the windows at Sarah Scout. And again, uh, working with uh, the Harcourt granite that comes from the country of Jajavarang and I was interested in the acrobatics. It's almost like these sculptures uh, with the glass where before I knew that there would only be a momentary um, performance of these works. I see these sculptures working with time in a different sense. Again, I'm really not sure how long they sculpt, the glass will continue to perform and act this acrobatic gesture of holding up this 36 piece, 36 kilo, weight of granite and 
I was also interested in the way it's installation in front of the window in order to let the light in, but also the kind of precariousness of the windows and the doors as well. So just, I was just gonna end here on the last installation of work where you can see again, the way the work shifts um, its concerns and or shifts um, its reading or possibility by the installation into a space. So here we had the opportunity to show at the establishment hotel where I, uh, there's a range of three sculptures that were in the Sarah Scout show, which I installed. You can see in the background there, oh, there it is. Um, over the bed where I, I fabricated a table to um, leverage over the bed itself. I was keen on the kind of going back to this notion of ab function, the unexpected role that the bed or the existing furniture would have to provide a plinth or a support uh, for the sculptures. Um, and again, following on with these particular works in the bathroom where um, I produced plinths that leveraged over the bath or over the basin or into the shower to, um, again, I guess, test the limits of the site and what the work would be able to produce. It was really quite an unex uh, I was really quite excited about, I've never thought about these works as being bathroom works, but it's also the, uh, the interest in the way an, a space actually then lends new meaning to a work. And obviously the notions of bubbles and forms as well. And yep, here's a detail of that particular sculpture, um, rock holding up number seven. And I'm just going to end here on um, another image from the bathroom series. So I think I'm going to leave it there and thank you very much and open for questions. Oops. Right, thank you so much, Simone. That was really uh, incredibly generous um, the way you took us through your practice. Uh, we've got time for some questions. And the way we're going to do questions is, um, if you have a burning question, we've probably got time for two or three questions. If you could send that question to um, Nick Pierce, who is waiting for them, and keep your, if everybody could keep their microphone muted till Nick calls on you, that would be great. So um, yeah, if you have a question, could you send that over to Nick, please? Nick, have we got any questions coming in? <laughs> we haven't had any questions at this stage. Okay, I'm going to count to 12 in my head. Great, any questions, Nick? Yes, I have a couple of questions coming in. Great, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, I'm just going to hand over to Lars Wenner first. Go ahead, Lars. Um, I'm muted. Hi. Um, hi, thank you so much. That was a really amazing uh, selection of works that you've shared with us. Um, I was wondering, where does the upscale end? Like, how um, have you thought about how? Um, how far you can push it beyond this? Is that important uh, for you in your uh, further discoveries? Um, thanks, Lars. I can't see you here. I would love to be able to see you, but anyway, um, <laughs> you look, it's exactly the problem I'm continuing to work with. And uh, in fact, I've just started that on that problem right now, except that maybe it'll be halted for a short while. <laughs> given we may not be able to go and travel. But yes, that's something that I'm interested in working in. I guess the question is, you know, really, what are the limits of um, the glass being able to support what rocks? And what I've found is that some rocks don't, uh, some rocks are much more fragile and vulnerable to the um, yeah, heat. So yeah, that's something I'm looking at. Don't know right. if that's a very helpful answer. It's pretty direct. <laughs> 
Anyone yeah, else? We're going to go over to Chelsea now. Hello. Hi, Chelsea. Uh, Simone, I was just wondering how you handle or grapple with glass breakages during the creating process. Like, how do you cope with potential disappointment and frustrations with breaking materials? Um, thanks, Ch Chelsea. I have to tell you, Chelsea, I'm really fairly... Uh, something I haven't really talked about much in this pro presentation but, um, is... ..that really... F oh, heaven. Sorry, that was actually my husband's phone call. Did you hear that? No, maybe not. Um, oh, oh. Uh, so failure is really a big part of the practice and has been from the get-go. I've always made sculptures. One thing I didn't really say at the beginning, one of the reasons why I was interested in the problem of sculptures holding up is that my sculptures always fell over from art school. So I just figured that you might as well capitalize on what you're really gifted at and what I was gifted at was making sculptures that collapsed so that's always meant since I've started my practice failure breakages um, starting all over again has been a really critical part of the pro practice so and also working with glass blows they're just it's just common common everyday occurrence for glass breaking so you just anything that fails or breaks is an opportunity to um maybe it's not meant to be or maybe um you know, maybe uh, there's another solution that actually will turn out to be better than the work you'd initially thought of. So, yeah, one of those sculptures, it's funny, just obviously didn't want to be made. I made, I had three attempts to make this one sculpture, which I thought would be good with the rocks and the glass. And every time the glass broke, it broke unexpectedly, then it broke in transit. I put it too tight in my suitcase and it broke. And it just, in the end, it was like, well, maybe it wasn't meant to be. So. That's how I cope. We've probably got to make the most of it. We've got time for one more question. Have we got one more question, Nick? Yeah, we've got a few more, but um, I'll hand over to Rene Diaz next. Oh, hi, oh, I'll start my video. Uh, hi, Simone. Hi, Rene. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good, just, thank you. Just a, uh, just a quick question. Um, I'm clearly working with different types of materials than myself and I'm exploring at the moment. Um, and uh, the question I'm asking is, was there a reason why you were drawn to these particular materials at all? Um, do you mean the glass and rocks work? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess what I'm, I guess even from the beginning, I'm, I've always been interested in what is the vulnerable thing that could be used to hold up something else. So I'm interested in maybe when I started out with glass, I wasn't always thinking, oh, I'd love to work with glass. I was, it was an opportunity that came along and, but I wanted to, and in a way I take all that, that's often the case with the practice. One thing leads to another, and then I try to use the kind of conceptual underpinnings of the practice in which to um, provide a method for working. So particularly with stone and glass, what's become really of uh, interest to me is glass is the same material. It comes from sand. It has this geological condition. So I'm, I'm loving that um, relationship between, yeah, and also the other most fascinating thing is I have started a conversation with um, a wonderful woman called um, uh, Ashley Hood, who's at the University of Melbourne, and she's a geologist. She's actually the L'Oreal, I've got this correct, uh, STEM scientist uh, person of the year at the moment. And she was telling me that actually scoria, those red scoria rocks are actually also a form of glass because of the way they were thrown out of the volcano and the kind of heat, they're actually a form of glass. So I'm interested in those um, physical properties as well. Did that answer your question? Renee, hello. Oh, I, think it, it, I think it answered the question, Simone. I've lost Renee. <laughs> um, look, we're gonna, we're gonna wind up now, but I... Um, Firstly, Simone, thank you so much for um, not just the generosity of sharing your work, but actually, you know, the generosity of taking the time to 
to reorganize and recalibrate and, and do your presentation via Zoom. I also really want to acknowledge my, um, my colleague, Nick Pierce, for making the whole uh, Zoom experience so simple. Um, and, and really, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Just for people who don't know, we had 137 people participate in this, um, in this presentation. Um, and a special shout out to Emmanuel Rodriguez. Yeah, I want uh, to say that too. You know, so, so great that we can extend the function of uh, art forum around the planet. Um, so really uh, much love to you and your families at this time. And um, I'll send you details of our next art forum next Thursday. And um, we really thank you for being part of this great VCA community. Goodbye, everyone. Cheers. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nick. And thank you so much, David. Thank you all for coming.